Who was the first delegate to receive a standing ovation from the United Nations? And where have the Winter Olympics never been held? <laughs> Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh no. <laughs> Answers to those and other questions coming up in this episode of The Off Ramp with Bob and Marsha Smith. Welcome to the off-ramp, a chance to slow down, steer clear of crazy, take a side road to sanity, and get some perspective on life. Well, this might seem like a simple question. Where <laughs> have the Winter Olympics never been held, Marcia? Okay, Arizona. No, no, we're talking part of the world. Oh, a part of the world. Well, South Pacific. Well, that's true, but not that part of the world, a bigger, bigger part of the world. Bigger, Here, bigger part. I'll tell you the answer, and you'll say, well, of course, okay. Yeah, in the South Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere. Okay, I got it. Then. Okay. Now, that might seem like, well, so of course not. Yeah. Well, there are places where there are snowy conditions, like the Andes in South America. We have mountains. Uh -huh. But the Winter Olympics have never been held in the Southern Hemisphere. They've always been held in the Northern Hemisphere, all 24 of them, counting the 2022 Winter Olympics in China. But perhaps one day the Andes Mountains or the South African ski country will play host to there's, the Winter Olympics. There's ski country in South Africa? Yeah, there are places really? in Africa where there are mountains with snow, of course, like Kilimanjaro has snow and other places. Well, I never thought of that yeah. before. So okay. I'm just kind of an interesting tidbit. <laughs> okay, Bob, who was the first delegate of the United Nations to receive a standing ovation? Standing ovation. Who would that be? So somebody universally recognized as a, a good person. Would that be Eleanor Roosevelt? Yes! <laughs> there, is it because I read her book, her that bio? That was part of it, but I knew she was the one of the first American delegates to the United Nations. She was our first in 1948. She didn't want to do it. She said, I'm not qualified. Well, turns out, guess what? She was more qualified than everybody there, <laughs> to her amazement. She was a mover and a shaker, and she was the driving force behind the Universal Declaration of Human, Human Rights. Rights. Oh, yep. yes, yep. that's a she, famous document. Yeah, that's her. That's her. FDR's widow was the first person to ever have all members of the 51 nations across the globe. This gets me for clump. Uh, they all rose from their chairs to honor that 64-year-old woman sitting among them. <laughs> I think it took her to tears, too. Well, and of course, that was, uh, I'm sure, in recognition of FDR, who had recently died. Yeah, you know? but she did all this. I mean, she, this was, she was very much on her own at the United Nations. So. Anyway, carry on. Okay, Marcia, what are the five least populated states in the United States? Now, uh, here's the definition. Okay. Only five U.S. states have a population below one million people. Okay. What uh, are they? Wyoming. Wyoming is one. Montana. Nope. South Dakota. Yes, South Dakota. North Dakota? Yes, both. Okay, so I got so you three. got three. Two more to go. Uh, One's in New England. Oh, is it New Hampshire? No. Rhode Island. No. Okay. You'd think Rhode Island, but Rhode Island has some big cities. Yeah. yeah. Vermont. Oh. And one more. Out west. Out west, up north. Yeah. Is it? It's the not biggest. What? I already said Montana. The biggest state in the union. Oh, Alaska. Alaska, the biggest state in the union, still has less than a million people. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so these are the ones. You you were right. Wyoming is number one. That's the least populated state. It's the ninth largest state in area, but it has a population of only half a million people. So that's 5.8 people per square mile. Two is Vermont. Three is Alaska. Twice the size of Texas, but uh, only 1.2 people per square mile. 732,000 people there. Uh, North Dakota is next, and South Dakota. They both have about seven hundred to 800,000 people. But Wyoming has got the least amount of people of all states, 578,803. Huh. Interesting. So those yeah. are the five least populated states in the United States. We got a lot of big sky out there. That's right. That's right. But that's in Montana. So, yeah. That <laughs> Which is, is not on the big list. big sky. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And it's on their license plate. So you just plate, confused I everybody. Yeah, did Marsh. I? Okay. I don't think I have that power, Bob. I confuse you and myself. But <laughs> All right. What do these songs all have in common? 
Yellow Submarine, Ferry Cross the Mersey, Alice Restaurant, Ode to Billy Joe, Harper Valley PTA, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Who'll Stop the Rain, and Red-Headed Stranger, which wow. I, I never heard of that last Oh, that's, a, that's a big w- Willie Nelson song. Yeah. I don't know what would be in common. Several of those are about water, of course. Mm-hmm. The three or four of them, they're about mm-hmm. water, but I don't know. What's the common denominator? Well, they all served as inspiration for movies. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, but, again, the, the ones are? Uh, the Yellow Submarine, Ferry Cross the Mersey, Alice's Restaurant, Ode to Billy Joe, Harper Valley, PTA. I remember that one, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Who'll Stop the Rain, and Red-Headed Stranger. Obviously, some of the movies changed the name, mm-hmm. but several kept the name, and others inspired the movie. Well, Marcia, the Winter Olympics are in full swing. I ask you one question about the Winter Olympics, but I've got others here, too. What country has hosted the most Winter Olympics? Oh, gosh. All right. I'll say uh, Winter Olympics. That's right. Just winter. I'll say uh, Switzerland. No. Okay. Norway. Uh, No. Okay. Canada. No. All right. The U.S. The U.S. Really? The U.S. has hosted four Winter Olympic Games. Nobody's hosted more than that. Uh, China's done two. France is second, hosting three times. The 1924 Games in Chamonix and the 1968 Games in Grenoble and the 1992 (laughs) Games in Albertsville. I love it when you're continental. Grenoble. Grenoble. All right, now when and where were the first Winter Olympic Games? When and where? When and where? They're relatively new. Uh, what's oh the, the the 20th century? Okay, it's not uh, it's not uh, Sun Valley, is it? No, that's all I remember is that one. Okay, uh, I don't know. Chamonix, France, Chamonix, in 1924, and the event was called the International Winter Sports Week. It was renamed later, but athletes from 16 countries competed in six sports. And then four years later, Saint Moritz in Switzerland was the host of the second Winter Games. Okay, here's a quickie. What do the initials MG stand for on the famous British-made car? Oh, the MG. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know this one. I wouldn't have guessed this. Morris Garages. Oh, is that right? (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, uh, Morris Garages were owned by William Morris, and it was a private retail sales and service company. It was headquartered in London. But since 2007, guess who owns it? The Chinese. (laughs) (laughs) They still keep MGs, though. Yes, yes. Oh, that's funny. You always have a riddle every once in a while because, you know, I hate riddles. Yes, yes. So I have a riddle for you. It's a a puzzle, sort of, okay? Okay. Okay, this is the word standard, S-T-A-N-D-A-R-D. Okay, Uh just think of that, the word standard. Take away two letters and add three digits To make a logical sequence, do you have any idea what that might be? If you take away certain letters from that word, standard, you create a logical sequence of numbers. One, two, and three? First, second, and third. First, second, and third. Yeah, if you take away the two A's and add one, two, and three, you get first, second, third from that word. Do we give that to the little woman? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) All right. Okay. No no more riddles for you. No. You you know who won the first Super Bowl, right? That was the Green Bay Packers. That's right. You can't possibly live. The French team in Green Bay. (laughs) You can't possibly live here and not answer that. But, (laughs) But do you know who made the first touchdown in that first game? Bart Starr. No. No, I don't know, honey. The first touchdown. This is somebody you know, and it wasn't Bart Starr. Paul Holman. No. Who? It was Max McGee. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have guessed that. I didn't know that. Now you do. Uh, Okay. How about a guy named Hand Solo, Bob? Hand, not Han Solo. That's right. Also known as David Aguilar. He was born without a right forearm. In 2017, he built himself a purely mechanical prosthesis. It was made out of what? Uh, I have no idea. Any clue? It's a toy. Really? He, a prosthesis out of a toy? That works. Okay, so it's some kind of a claw uh, or a uh, erector set thing? Is that what it was? Yeah, not too far away, but this is hard to believe. Legos. 
Okay. It's, yes. He built it from a Lego Technic helicopter set. And it features a movable elbow joint and a grabber so he can pick things up. And he activates it by bending his elbow. Hmm. Where there's a will, there's a way. Oh, gosh, yeah. You should see it. It's it's uh, really cool. And his name is Hand Solo? Well, that's his actual name. No, no. Okay. His real name is David Aguilar. Aguilar. Okay. But that's his, <laughs> that's his handle otherwise, which is kind of cute. That's funny. I've got three did you know facts. All right. Just wondered if you know these. <laughs> did you know ransom paid to a kidnapper can be deducted as an expense on your income I tax? I did not know that. <laughs> That's good to keep in mind. A study at the University of Iowa has discovered that looking at nude people can stop you from coughing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And studies at the University of Virginia suggest you are more likely to catch a cold by holding hands than by kissing. Oh, I, yeah, really? Yeah. You know, because you probably rub your nose or something after you held hands with a... I don't know. That's some body function there. I've got a body question. If you'd like to tell your friends you weigh less than you normally do and not lie, when should you weigh yourself? Uh, f- first thing in the morning. No, when the moon is overhead. Oh, that's right. The, you're a little lighter. Yeah, the moon's gravitational the moon. pull. You're yeah. way less when it's overhead. So you can, even if you're not on a diet, you can say, oh, I weigh less than I do. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think it's only ounces, but yes. Oh, it's tiny fractions of stuff. Okay. What American actor mm-hmm. made this statement? I don't feel we did wrong in taking this country away from them. They were a great number of people who needed new land, and the Indians were selfish trying to keep it for themselves. That was John Wayne. (laughs) You know that? Oh, yeah, that's a famous quote. Is it? Yeah, they were selfish keeping this land. We needed it. (laughs) A lot of people needed it. I know how... Unself aware can you be when you say something like that? We should have gone up and knocked on his door. We'd like your house. It's selfish of you to keep it. Yeah, really. Can we have it? Kind of selfish to have this big estate of yours. Get out, John. Okay, Marcia, do you know what is second sleep? You ever heard of this expression? No. Does that mean like uh, when you when you fall asleep the second time during the night? Yes, that? that's exactly what it is. And you know, this whole idea that we should sleep in eight-hour chunks, it's relatively recent. Most people don't do that. And it's not because of what people think. A lot of people think, oh, it's modern technology. It's electricity. It's computers. It's mm-hmm. a cable TV. It's But it's always been this way? Yeah. Yeah. And they know that now because they've done some research A history professor at Virginia Tech named Roger Eckrich spent hours investigating the history of the night, and he began to notice strange references to sleep in classic literature. Uh A character in the Canterbury Tales, for instance, decides to go back to bed after her first sleep. Ah. A doctor in England wrote that the time between the first sleep and the second sleep was the best time for study and reflection. And in the 16th century, a French physician concluded that laborers were able to conceive more children because they waited until after (laughs) the first sleep to make love. Well, that was an interesting experiment. (laughs) Yeah, so sleeping in segments is as old as time. Tale as old as time. (laughs) Yeah, but apparently it's not anything new. You know, this idea that you wake up maybe one, two, three times. In fact, for centuries, a period of quiet wakefulness between the first sleep and the second sleep was known as a watch. And yes, it was often used for prayer or writing or sex, even for visiting neighbors. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, really? Let's try that tonight at three in the morning. Hey, yeah, people people look forward to time in the middle of the night as a chance for Getting the jump on all kinds of things or just getting a jump, amorous activity. I'll be darned. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, Okay. Okay, but you are getting enough sleep. It doesn't matter if it's in chunks. It's always been that way. Huh. Well, consider myself enlightened, Bob. All right. Okay. What's the most expensive silent movie ever made? That would be one of the D.W. Griffith films. Uh, Was it uh, Intolerance? No. Birth of a Nation? No. What was it? Ben Hur. Oh, Ben Hur. Didn't yes. you just watch that recently? I did. I actually went on Turner Sunday Silence, is yeah. what they call it, and I actually watched parts of it. Yeah, I didn't want to watch the whole thing. It you know, gets it's tedious. Three point nine million dollars. That was a lot of money back in when the the twenties when they made that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what's the best country to live in if you're a house cat? If you're a house cat, yeah. <laughs> so that must be a place where there's a lot of mice. No. No? No. The best. How do you define as best? Is there a way to define that without living giving? Living condition. What would it be the United States? No. 
Oh, oh. Where, where would it be? <laughs> no. France. Give me your... In France. Give me your cat voice. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What? No, when you're talking to me as a oh, cat oh, in a yes. commercial. Oh, yeah. So, I hate this tuna. Get <laughs> yeah. me something else, <laughs> yeah. for God's sake. Yes, the aristocratic uh, house cat. No. According to National Geographic, and they wouldn't lie, that would be Switzerland. Oh, really? Why, you say? Why, I say? Because cats there have freedom, autonomy and their own cat-specific architecture. <laughs> cat architecture. It's true. Be it on the side of a townhouse or an apartment complex, they have their own little custom-built kitty ladders and ramps. Kitty ladders? Yeah. Litters and ladders. Ladders and ramps. Okay. Litters, ladders, and ramps. I think that's a song. And are designed so cats can come and go as they please. <laughs> we, you go off to work and that lazy cat wakes up, oh, I think I'll go for a walk. <laughs> They're found. Cat ladders are found all all over Europe, but they're particularly abundant in Switzerland because they have like uh, 1.5 million domestic cats in that little country. And that's because most people live in rented homes and Swiss landlords are more open to allowing cats than dogs. How interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so cats are better in Switzerland than any other place. Well, they just have more... Uh, I mean, they're better off. Yeah. Okay. Lots of autonomy. That's good to know. <laughs> I need to send a cat somewhere. Uh-huh. You'll be better off, believe me. <laughs> okay. Uh, back to the Winter Olympics. What country, up to this point, has won the most medals in the Winter Olympic Games? I'll give you some countries here. Okay. The United States, Norway, Germany, or Russia? Uh, One I'll, of those countries I'll has won the, the most. I'll say United States. The United States. Correct. No. Okay. Give me another one. Russia. No. no. <laughs> What's left? We have Germany and Norway. Oh, Norway. Yes. Norway has participated in all 24 Winter Olympics. Yeah. Going into the 2022 Olympics in Beijing, Norway had won the most total medals, 368. And it also led the way in total gold medals with 132. After Norway, the top medal-winning countries at the start of these 2022 games were the United States, who has won 305, Germany, which had won 240, and Austria, which had won 232. Yeah. All right, now, the next Winter Olympics will also be in the Northern Hemisphere. Where will they be? The next one? I don't know. The next Winter Olympics? I don't know. Northern Italy. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, the preparations for the uh, 2026 uh, games will be the Italian cities of Milan and Cortina <laughs> d'Ampezio. <laughs> Well, it's something like that. Yeah. Uh, it'll be the first Winter Olympics officially held in two host cities. Oh, yeah. What's the other one? I just read them. Oh, those were two cities? Yes. I thought it was one. What, do you think that was an appetizer <laughs> at a meal or something? I think we're... Milan and a pez, you know, toys. <laughs> I think we're past taking a break. With some ketchup. Oh, okay. Uh, you're listening to The Off-Ramp with Bob... And Marsha. ...Smith. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. We're here with the off-ramp, Bob and Marcia Smith, and Marcia has a question. Yes. Name the top three states in America for producing oranges. Well, the top three states for producing oranges. I would say it's Florida, California, and what would the third one be? That's the trick. Ah, would that be Georgia, perhaps? Yep, nope, those are peaches. Would that be... Um, hmm, where would that? Texas. Yes. Okay. Very good. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, Marcia, this is a question near and dear to your heart because your former heartthrob, Aaron Rodgers, before he got, <laughs> got weird. Uh, <laughs> every year since... You mean Dr. Rogers? Yes, that's right. <laughs> every year since 1957, the Associated Press has given a Most Valuable Player Award to a national football player, right? Uh -huh. Now, over the years, it's been linebackers, defensive running backs, defensive tackles, even place kickers, but primarily what? Quarterbacks. Okay, question. Is there any science supporting the contention that a quarterback is the most valuable player? Is there any science, science. behind that? Science, well, yes. Well, Aaron doesn't like science, so I'll say. <laughs> um, Just quickly, I, yes or no? No. Yes, there is. No. <laughs> <laughs> wrong again. You're wrong, 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 Marcia. <laughs> Yes, uh, a New York Times sports article by Mike Tainer says most analytical models suggest even ordinary quarterbacks actually add more quantifiable value to their teams in terms of yards, points, and victories than the most spectacular players at any other position. Really? And he, he gives an example here. 
Indianapolis Colts running back Jonathan Taylor. He led the NFL with 1,518 rushing yards, 1,854 scrimmage yards, and 19 rushing and receiving touchdowns. Analytics showed that his rushing added 479 more yards to the Colts' offense this season than a replacement-level running back. However, quarterbacks actually add more than that. 12 NFL quarterbacks added more than 479 yards. In fact, top quarterbacks add well over 1,000 yards per year to their offenses. So there you go. Basically, there is a science that the quarterback is the... I assumed that, but I thought you were trying to catch It's me. a little arcane, but it all works together. If you kind of immerse yourself in it and read these statistics, I guess it does make sense, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. Not only that, they're calling the shots. <laughs> That's right, they are. In the movie, Goldfinger, name... The Korean man with the steel derby hat. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about that movie. That's a long time ago. Yeah, but steel you know that movie is hat. always around. Yeah, I forgot about that. He's a, he was a little, yeah, a little Asian, he, a Korean man. He I don't was know an who. assassin. Oh, a famous fictional character. What was his name? Odd Job. That was his name yeah. as a character. <laughs> yeah. He was one of the most famous fictional characters in the 007 movies. Odd job. Okay, didn't know that, did you? Okay, no, I gotcha. didn't. All I right. didn't know that. Ask me a question. Two more Olympic Games questions. Okay. Snowy owls were the official mascots of what Winter Olympic Games? What country? Let's just say that. Snow. Was Snowy it, owls. Uh, uh, well, they have a lot of them in... Uh, in what country? Germany. No. No, it wasn't Russia, was it? No, it was in the 1998 Winter Olympics in Japan. Uh-huh. Four snowy owls called Snowlets were the official mascots. They actually were cute cartoon images. And they actually had names. They were Suki, Noki, Leki, and Tsuki. Leki? They represent. <laughs> I'm sorry, Leki, Leki, L-E-K-K-I. They represented, respectively, fire, air, earth, and water. Okay, uh- and why is a quarry... A quarry on a Scottish island critical to the Winter Olympics. A quarry, you know, a place where they're digging up yeah, stone. Yeah, yeah. In a Scottish island. It's critical to the Winter Olympics, every Winter Olympics, because something comes from there. Snow. No. Water. No. <laughs> stone. <laughs> yes. Oh, they built, I don't know, they helped build the structures for, I have no idea. It's a sports stone, the curling stones. Every, oh, really? Oh. Every single Olympic curling stone comes from a quarry on a small island off the coast of Scotland. The granite found there is considered to be some of the hardest and purest in the world. Ah. And curling stone sizes are standardized. Each has to be made of 44 pounds of solid Scottish granite. That's a lot. 44 40 pounds. pounds are heavy. The Scottish granite maintains its shape despite the moist, cold conditions of the icy curling sheet. But all of the curling stones, no matter what nation is playing, they all come, from, come from that Just quarry in Scotland. Who won the most World Series? The New York Yankees. That's right. They have gone to 40 World Series. They've wow. played in four. Then they won 27 of them, so more than more than half. They have the most championship appearances and the most victories by any team in the four major North American professional sports leagues. So wow. across the board of all different sports, they got the most. The most. The, the Yankees. <laughs> the Bears. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a sport of sorts. We hear about it a lot these days because people are trying to destroy it. Back in the days when the filibuster was really popular, a record was set for the longest congressional speech in history by one person. Who said it? How long was it? How long did that filibuster the, last? The longest congressional speech. Two in days. Parts of two days. It was Huey Long, the Louisiana uh-huh. senator. He set the record in 1935. He started at 12.30 p.m. on June the 12th, and he dropped from physical exhaustion into his seat at 4 a.m. the next morning. Okay. He'd been speaking continuously for 15 and a half hours, the longest speech on record at the time. The speech was 150,000 words long, and it took up 100 pages of the congressional record. <laughs> and it cost the government $5,000 to print it. I know a couple of women who couldn't do that. And that included cooking recipes and jokes, not just spitting. He just rambled, He had to right? talk. Yeah, he had to talk. Okay, I've, I've got two more Winter Olympics things here, okay? And then I'll quote. Yeah, then you'll wrap it up with a quote. Okay, what Olympic resort did not exist when the Olympics for it were announced? Sun Valley? 
It wasn't Sun Valley. <laughs> I keep going inside. It was Squaw Valley. Oh, that's it. Where is that? That exactly? was in uh, in California. Okay. That, uh, that I forgot all about that. Yeah, that area in Northern California near Lake Tahoe. Anyway, so Squaw Valley got the Olympics that year, 1960. Yes. The developer there, uh, Alexander Cushing, bid for Squaw Valley to host the games, and his dream resort didn't even exist. But the International Olympic Committee was very impressed when he was going to build out that area in Northern California near Lake Tahoe for the Games. So Squaw Valley got them. Squaw Valley's Olympics were the only ones without bobsled competitions. But there was something introduced in those Olympics we see all over the place these days in all kinds of professional sports games. When we pause for a moment to look at the... Reruns. Instant replay. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, that, that was introduced in the 1960 Winter Olympics I at Squaw Valley. So I got that right. All right. Now, the film Cool Runnings, that followed the Olympic bobsled team of what country? Oh, gosh. It was an island, wasn't it? Yes. It was, uh, oh, gosh. I can see them. Trinidad. Jamaica. Jamaica. And they do have a, a team in this year's Olympics, too, Good. the Jamaicans. I love it. I think it's great from a totally different yeah. climate. All right, and uh, just one last note. We talked about how the uh, Chinese had to manufacture artificial snow for this Olympics. 1964, the Innsbruck Games, same problem, very different solution. They didn't have big machines to make snow, so what did they do? The Austrian government had to call in the military. They carved 20,000 blocks of ice and 1.4 million cubic feet of snow from nearby mountains and transported them to the Olympic grounds. Oh, my God. How could... (sighs) That must have been a much bigger effort than, you know... Than a machine that blows artificial snow. I can't. Well, I can't believe it. So they, so they took ice there. Or they took snow. They from took mountains? ice and snow from nearby mountains. What was the ice for? What did they do with that? Well, probably for skating. You got it. You make it. Oh my and gosh. you got an army to help you do it. Yeah. 1964. So, same problem. Very different solution. <laughs> okay. It's the month of for Valentine's Day, Bob. Let's talk romance. I'm going to give you a quote from an unknown person. Okay. It's easy to fall in love. The hard part is finding someone to catch you. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty good. And that was a famous person? No, unknown. Oh, unknown. Which is, they're pretty famous. They're everywhere. (laughs) Those unknown and anonymous. Yes. I mean, they wrote a lot of stuff. They got married. They wrote a lot of stuff. (laughs) Okay. I'm Bob Smith. I'm Marcia Smith. Hope you join us again next time when we return with more trivia on The The Off Ramp. The Off-Ramp is produced in association with CPL Radio Online and the Cedarbrook Public Library, Cedarbrook, Wisconsin.